Hey guys, it's Miss Minnelli, and I'm going to give you the very, very, very last lesson in our unit on probability, um, especially as it relates to random variables and binomial distributions, um, because what we basically want to be able to do is kind of transition from the binomial distribution into a normal distribution when we're dealing with categorical data. Um, and so this is the last little piece. It's not going to be that long of a video, so make sure you take good notes. Um, so the outcomes for this lesson are basically, again, to review the conditions for a binomial distribution, um, to com compute probabilities that involve a binomial distribution, um, and then also look at situations where um, a normal distribution can be used to approximate um, a binomial probability. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple different um, examples. Um, we're also going to take a look at the distributions themselves to know the shape um, and the center and the spread. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about um, is statistical sampling. If you think about it, when we take a sample um, for a survey or, um, you know, if, if we're just going to take a sample to, to test something, when we sample from a population, we do not replace the object from which we, sa we sample. Um, and that can cause problems for us. We've looked at situations, for example, if I'm drawing cards from a deck. If I've got 52 cards in a deck and I'm interested in the red cards, um, if I draw a card out of the deck, I know that half of the cards are red, half of the cards are black. But if I don't put the card back, then I don't have the same probability anymore because I don't have 26 red cards in the deck anymore. I only have 25. And instead of having 52 cards left in the deck, I only have 51. And so when I don't replace the card back into the deck, the probability changes and I no longer have that condition of independence. The thing is, when we sample, that's how we sample. We sample without replacement. So that's going to cause a really big problem for us if we never have independence, because I'll never be able to use a binomial distribution um, or some of the other probability distributions that we use in this course. So we have this rule of thumb that basically says, as long as the population is much larger than the sample, then if I'm drawing without replacement, it's OK. I can say that um, a count of successes could be approximately binomial. I can have that independence um, as long as the population is much, much larger than the sample, because the probability of success isn't really going to change all that much. And so what, this is what our first rule of thumb is. Um, it's called the 10% condition. And this is what the formula looks like. But I like to think of it this way. Capital N refers to our population. And as long as our population is at least 10 times the size of our sample, then we can go ahead and assume we have independence. Because there's going to be such a difference that when I, when I do sample without replacement, the probability of success really doesn't change very much. And so as long as the population is at least 10 times the size of the sample, or if you think of it, um, as long as the sample is no more than 10% of the population, it doesn't really matter how you look at it, um, as long as we have that relationship, then I can assume independence and proceed. And in this case, that would enable us to use a binomial distribution. So in a lot of probability distributions that we're going to use second semester, there are going to be some conditions that you have to check. Independence is going to be one of them. And so because we're sampling without replacement, you need to be careful. So anytime you're sampling from without replacement, you're going to now need Need to include this, this condition that you're checking, that the population is at least 10 times the sample. And again, this is just when sampling without replacement. And it really only matters if you have a finite population. So if I'm pulling things off an assembly line, and that I'm just going to assume that my manufacturing process continues on and on and on, that would be an infinite population. So sampling without replacement isn't really a big deal. It's like tossing a die over and over and over again. Um, but if I'm drawing from a finite population, so if I'm thinking about like students at our school, there's about 1,000 students here. Um, if I were taking a sample of size 50, well, 50 times 10 is 500. And I know that's less than my population, so the condition would be met. But if I I was taking a sample of, say, 120 students. When I multiply that by 10, that gives me 1,200, which is larger than our population. So that condition wouldn't be met there. That means when I sample without replacement, I no longer have the independence. So this enables us to have to, to kind of keep that independence. 
So let's take a look at these two scenarios. In number one, it says we're drawing 10 cards from a standard deck of 52 cards without replacement and observing the number of hearts. And basically, I want to know, is a binomial distribution appropriate? And, and really, the bottom line is, do I have independence? So let's check. Remember, we're checking to see, is the population at least 10 times our sample size? Well, with the deck of cards, we know the population is 52. So is 52 greater than or equal to 10 times my sample size, which also happens to be 10? And that's a question we need to answer. Well, I know that 50 is not greater than or equal to 100. So that condition would not be met. I would not have the independence that I need to proceed with a binomial distribution. But let's take a look at the next scenario. Now I have a jar of 500 bar marbles, and I know that 20% of them are red. So I'm still going to be drawing a sample of 10 without replacement. So notice I'm, I'm drawing the same size sample, and I'm not replacing it. But this time, the population that I'm drawing from has 500 in it. And again, I, know, I happen to know the population has 500. And so I'm just going to check. 500 is greater than or equal to 10 times my sample size, which again is 10. And since 500 is, in fact, greater than or equal to 100, I can assume independence. And that tells me that we have an approximately binomial distribution. And my n value in this case would be 500, and the p in this case would be 20. In all of the situations that we've been looking at so far, we've just sort of assumed independence without checking this condition. So the only difference is now we formally have to check this condition. We actually have to write it down on our paper. And very often, we don't know the size of a population, so it is an assumption. So if I'm talking about drawing students, um, drawing a sample of students from a school, um, I would say something like assume the population, and let's say I'm drawing a sample of size 20, so I'd say assume the population is at least 10 times 20 or 200 students. Because if I don't know the size of the population, I want to still be able to proceed. So if I just have to state it as an assumption. And you're going to see, we're going to hit this over and over and over again second semester. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about is how we can actually um, merge into using a normal distribution um, for some binomial settings. And um, the goal here, there's an activity on the next page that I'm going to want you to do. Um, the goal here is to kind of figure out what conditions are, are required for the normal distribution and the binomial distribution to sort of produce the same probabilities. So what I have here are three different histograms. These are three different binomial distributions. Um, and so if you take a look at the first one, I'm taking a sample of size 10, and the probability of success is 80%. And so if I multiply them, that gives me my mean of 8. If you look at the next distribution, this time I'm taking a sample of size 20, but my probability of success is still 80%. 80% of 20 is 16, so there's my mean. And then in the last scenario, we're looking at a much bigger sample of size 50. Again, the probability of success is 80%. And if I take 80% of 50, that gives me a mean of 40. So you can see that all of the distributions are centered around their mean and that they all look relatively bell-shaped and symmetric. But what you might notice is that with the smaller of the sample sizes, um, it's not perfectly symmetric. It looks almost like the distribution may be slightly skewed to the left. Um, but hopefully what you'll notice as our sample size gets larger, the distribution appears to be a little bit more bell-shaped. So our goal is to identify at which point a binomial distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution. Because all of the three graphs that you see are binomial. But what you might also notice is that once I get to this point, it looks like a normal distribution as well. So we want to kind of come up with some conditions. So turn the page, you've got an activity. And on that front page, um, you have a bunch of graphs. So these are all binomial distributions with different probabilities of success and different trials. And you're given the probability histogram. And in problem number one, you're asked to note the shape of each histogram and then to place a check mark next to the graphs that appear to be bell-shaped and symmetric. And the goal, again, is to identify which types of binomial distributions could be approximated by a normal distribution. So go ahead and press pause on the video and just take a little bit of a look um, at the different graphs and circle the ones or put a check mark next to the ones that appear to be bell shaped and symmetric. Okay, so what you should have noticed, or what I hope you've noticed, is that um, most of the graphs in the center, 
appear to be bell-shaped and symmetric. Um, and so if we look at what is causing them to be bell-shaped and symmetric, hopefully you notice the probability of success is one half which means that the probability of failure is also one half. And so we have that symmetry simply because our probability is at 0.5. And so all of those graphs appear to be bell-shaped and symmetric. Now remember, with a normal distribution, we have that requirement of the empirical rule that 68% that of my observations are within one standard deviation, 95 are within two standard deviations, and then 99.7 are within three standard deviations. So while each one of these graphs is bell-shaped and symmetric, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's also normal. Well, let's take a look at some other graphs. Obviously, if I take a look at, at the right, or I'm sorry, at the left corner, I can see that these graphs tend to be skewed. But what I also notice is that my, as my trials get larger, as my n value increases, I'm starting to see the symmetry again. I'm starting to see the bell shape and the symmetry. So I can also look at what happens for my probability of success when it's 0.8. Notice all these graphs tend to be skewed to the left. And then as my n value increases, what you should notice is that my graphs appear to be more bell-shaped and symmetric. So if we're trying to come up with a rule, it seems like when the probability of success is close to 0.5, or when my trials are very large, I get a bell-shaped and symmetric graph. Well, we want to know exactly like what values of n and p are going to help um, determine when to use a normal distribution. I also want to make sure that my normal distribution is appropriate. So on the next page, if you can flip your paper over, there are two problems with two parts to them, or an A and a B. And what I'd like to do is go through the first one with you and then um, have you do number four on your own. So if you take a look at number three, it says X is a binomial distribution with a probability of success of 0.5. In part A, we're going to let N be 0.5. I'm sorry, we're going to let N be 5. So that means X is a binomial with an N value of 5 and a P value of 0.5. First thing you're asked to do is to calculate um, these two quantities, N times P and N times 1 minus P. N times P might look familiar. That's your expected value or the expected number of successes in a binomial distribution. So n times 1 minus p would be the expected number of failures. So if I'm looking at n times p, I'm looking at 5 times 0.5, which is going to be 2.5. Okay, so that means on average I expect 2.5 successes, and if I do um, my number of failures, I'm going to have 5 times, again, 1 minus p is, again, still going to be 0.5, and I get 2.5 failures. And that's what these two numbers mean. This is the number of successes that I expect, and this would be the number of failures that we would expect. And the question asks, are both of these numbers at least 10? And no, they're both much smaller than 10. So now the next thing it asks us to do is to calculate the probability that uh, x is less than or equal to 4 using this binomial distribution. So this means that I'm going to use my binomial CDF. So if I go to my calculator, I'm going to scroll up to get to my binomial CDF. And so my trials are 5. My probability of success is 0.5. And my upper bound in this case is 4. So I'm looking for the probability that x is less than or equal to 4. And I get 0.96. That's probably going to round to a 9, right? So the probability that x is less than or equal to 4 is going to end up being 0.969, okay? And so in number three, it says to go ahead and calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the binomial random variable. So the mean we already calculated, remember that's basically what this is. The expected number of successes is the mean, that's two and a half. The standard deviation, though, is not the same as the expected number of failures. You have to take the square root of n times p times one minus p. So the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which is also 0.5, and that gives me 1.118. Okay, so basically now what I want to do is I want to try to use a normal distribution, and I want to see if the probability I get using a normal distribution is the same as the probability that I get when I use a binomial. And so in order to use a normal distribution, we need a mean and standard deviation. So I'm going to use the mean and the standard deviation of my, of my binomial random variable. To save time, I'm not going to worry about standardizing it. 
because I want you to see the relationship here. So now I'm going to go ahead to my normal distribution and I'm going to go to my normal CDF and because it's a less than or equal to, this is with a normal distribution, remember it's continuous so you have to have a lower and an upper bound. So my lower bound would be negative infinity or negative 99999. My upper bound would be 4. I'm going to go ahead and enter my mean of 2.5 and my standard deviation of 1.118. And I want to see if the probability I get using this distribution is similar to the probability I got in part two. And I get 0.91, that's pretty much it, 0 0.910. And I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, something that's close to 97% is not going to be very close to 91%. So these probabilities are not close and because they're not close, it would not be appropriate to use a normal distribution. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video, and I'd like you to go ahead and do Part B, the same way we did Part A. Just do Part B and see if you come up with the same answers. Okay. If you did it correctly, take a look at the answers to Part B. Notice this time in part one where it talks about calculating n, in, n times p and n times 1 minus p. And again, those are the expected number of successes and the expected number of failures. In this case, because our n is larger, um, our probability is still 1 half, but this time our sample or our trials are 20. And so I expect half of them to be successes and half of them to be failures. And so both of those numbers are going to be greater than or equal to 10. When I calculate the probability using a binomial distribution, I get 0.9987. I can calculate the mean and the standard deviation just like we did in the last problem. And if I use that mean and standard deviation with a normal distribution and calculate again the probability that x is less than or equal to 16, I get a probability of 0.996. And when I compare those two values now, I can see that 0.9987 and 0.996 are very, very close. And so in this case, it would be appropriate to use a normal distribution. I could. That would, that would be an alternative. I could use either one, um, and either one of those distributions would be acceptable here. And oftentimes, when we're sampling, we end up using a normal distribution. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit um, as we get into the next semester. Okay, I'd like you to go ahead and pause the video again and take a look at number four. And this time I'd like you to do both A and B. Okay, so let's go ahead and check your answers. If you look at, for, at um, problem number 4A, in this case we're looking at a sample of size 30 and a probability of success of 10%. When you calculate the probability that y is less than or equal to 4 using a binomial distribution, you get 0.825. If you find the mean and the standard deviation and then use a normal approximation, you only get 0.729. Obviously, those two probabilities are not close at all, and it would not be appropriate to use a normal distribution to approximate the situation. But let's take a look at what happens when I increase my sample size. So now my sample size is 100, or 100 trials. My probability of success is still pretty small, but when I calculate the number of successes and the number of failures, they're both greater than 10. And when that's the case, if I calculate the probability that y is less than or 16, oh, I'm sorry, less than or equal to 16, the probability I get is almost the same as the probability I get using a normal distribution. And so again, in this situation, it would be appropriate to use a normal distribution to approximate the binomial setting. So the ultimate question that we want to answer is, when is it okay to use a normal distribution? So I've seen some examples where it's not. I've seen some examples where it is. So think for a minute about what is in common um, among the ones where the normal approximation works. And it happens when the uh, number of successes, so that's your n times p, when the number of successes in your trials is expected to be at least 10, and the number of failures in your trials is expected to be at least 10. So as long as you have at least 10 successes and 10 failures in your trials, it is appropriate to use a normal distribution 
and you would use the mean and the standard deviation that you would calculate from the binomial setting using n and p. Um, you don't have to use a normal distribution um, to calculate the probability, but it's an option. So let's take a look at the next example. So in number two, or in this example, it says, suppose that 72% of students in the U.S. would give their teachers a positive rating if asked to score their effectiveness. A survey is conducted in which 500 students are randomly selected and asked to rate their teachers. Let X represent the number of students in the sample who would give their teacher a positive rating. Okay, so right now, the way X is defined, it looks like uh, success would be um, giving someone a positive rating. In order for me to use a binomial random variable, though, I have to show that we have independence. And so now I can't just write assume independence. I kind of have to check it now. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at my population, and I want to check to see if it's at least 10n. So do I know how many people or how many students there are in the United States? I don't. So this is going to be an assumption. I'm going to assume that the population of students in U.S. is at least greater than or equal to 10 times my sample size. And we said the sample size in this case is 500. So I'm assuming that there are at least 5,000 students in the US. And that's a totally reasonable assumption. And because that's true, I can now say that we have independence. OK, because I'm assuming that that's true. And so once I know that, I can go ahead and say that x is binomial. Now, you probably want to in indicate that it's approximately binomial. I have seen um, situations on the AP exam where students can be docked if they don't write the word approximate. Um, so it's approximately binomial because we don't know for sure that we have independence. We're just um, based on the fact that the population is so much larger than the sample, we'll say that it's approximately binomial. Um, my n value in this case is 500, and my probability of success is defined to be 72%. So there we go. And then it says in part B to use a normal approximation, and I first want to check to make sure that's okay, to determine the probability that 400 or more students would give their teacher a positive rating. So again, in order for me to use the binomial, or I'm sorry, the normal approximation, I have to check my n times p and my n times 1 minus p. So with n times p, again, I know I have 500 students and 72% would give their teacher a positive rating. So if I multiply 500 times 72%, I get 360. So 360 in my sample would give their teacher a positive rating. Then the number of failures is just going to be the difference of 360 and 500. So I can either multiply 500 times 0.28, or I can just subtract 500 minus 360, and that would leave me with 140 failures. Both of these numbers are greater than 10, or greater than or equal to 10. That condition is met. So not only is x binomial, I can also say that x is approximately normal, but I need a mean and a standard deviation. So the mean in this case is n times p, which we already calculated to be 360. It's going to go here. The standard deviation is going to be the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which is going to be 500 times 0.72 times 0.28. I'll need my calculator for that. Okay, we get 10.04. And so that's going to be my standard deviation. And so if I want to find the probability that 400 or more so if I'm now saying that x is normal, I'm going to say x is greater than or equal to. And actually, to be clear, I probably should use a different random variable so it's not confusing which distribution I'm using. So let's call this y now. So let's go ahead and say the probability that y is greater than or equal to 400. And again, I'm just going to, just to prove a point, I'm just going to, um, I'll go ahead and standardize it. So we've got 400 minus our mean of 360. And then I want to divide by our standard deviation, which is 10.04. That was just my previous answer. So I get 3.98. Now, I know that 3.98 is pretty far from the center. That's more than three standard deviations away from the mean. So I can already kind of tell that this probability is going to be very small. Um, again, I'm using a normal distribution, so I'm going to choose the normal CDF. 
and I'll go ahead and use my um, the number of students. So my lower bound is going to be 400. My upper bound is going to be 99999. The mean of that distribution of y is 360. And the standard deviation is 10.04. I already know that probability is going to be really small. So we end up with 3.389 which is impossible, so I want to look all the way down, all the way across the screen, and I can see that that's actually in scientific notation. That e negative 5 means it's times 10 to the negative 5. So I can see that that probability is very, very small. One of the reasons that we have to use the normal, or that we at some point had to use the normal, um, back in the day, like when I was in school, we didn't have the kind of technology that you have available to you. So if I wanted to calculate the probability that y was greater than or equal to 400 in a sample of 500, think about, think about what, that math, what math goes behind that. That would be the probability that y is 400 or 401 or 402 or 403. And again, these are all binomial um, formulas. So if you remember how complicated that formula is, if I'm adding 101 probabilities together, um, this is where your calculator sometimes can give you an overflow error message. So um, back in the day, before we had the technology available to us, we had to find a different way to find these kinds of probabilities. And so because there is this um, relationship between the binomial and the normal, we could kind of translate um, the situation into a normal distribution and then use our normal probability tables um, to calculate these probabilities. But that's why we had to do it. Okay, the very last thing I want to just point out um, has to do with the shapes of distributions. So um, the first thing, we already kind of saw this in the table on the front of your activity, um, but if you go back to your class notes, um, if we take a look at these three binomial distributions, each of them has an n of 10, so our sample size is 10, but you'll notice that the probabilities change. When the probability is 0.5, we already saw in the activity that this tends to be um, bell-shaped and symmetric. So we have the bell-shaped and symmetric distribution when our uh, p is 0.5. Be careful not to call it normal unless you physically check the n times p and the n times 1 minus p being greater than or equal to 10. So just remember, there's a difference between saying something's bell-shaped and symmetric and calling it normal. If it's normal, certain criteria has to be met, so just don't forget to check that criteria. But let's take a look at the other two situations. In the first one, my probability of success is really low. So if I'm doing, if you think about me like shooting baskets, for example, my probability of making a basket is probably going to be pretty low, probably lower than 20%. But if I were to make 10 attempts and I were to do this over and over and over again, I'm going to have a lot of situations where I just make a few baskets in that 10 attempts. I'm probably not going to have a lot of situations where I make all 10 baskets. So this is probably going to be where, I, where I'm going to live. If I keep over and over and over again taking 10 shots and counting how many I make, I'm probably going to be um, making very few shots in, in that group of 10. And so you'll notice when the probability is low, our distribution is actually skewed to the right. But Michael Jordan probably has a much, much higher probability of success when it comes to shooting baskets. And so if we were to put him on the free throw line and let him shoot 10 baskets, he's probably going to make most of those baskets most of the time. It's going to be a really rare occurrence for him to take 10 shots and not make any of the baskets. So when the probability is really high in a binomial distribution, our distribution tends to be skewed to the left. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. So when the probability is low, uh, the distribution is skewed to the right. When the probability is high, the distribution is skewed to the left. And then when the probability is close to 0.5, it's bell-shaped and symmetric. If our n times p and n times 1 minus p are greater than or equal to 10, we can take it one step further and say that the distribution is also approximately normal. Let's take a look at the geometric setting. So I did the same thing with the geometric. Um, it's a little bit harder with geometric because there is no limit to the number of trials, because remember, we're counting the number of trials it takes to get to one success. Um, and so you'll notice the, the graphs do look a little bit different. So for example, when the probability of success is really small, um, you might see that it takes a little while to get a success. Whereas when the probability is really high, we start to see that success right away. But in every situation, for all geometric random variables, our distribution is going to be skewed to the right. So what I'd like you to do now, this is the very last thing, I have six different distributions 
And I want you to pause the video and think about what the shapes of those distributions should look like. Okay, let's see how well you did. When, the when you're dealing with a binomial distribution and the probability is 0.5, it should be bell-shaped and symmetric. In part B, because my sample is so large, um, I've got 50 in my sample. Remember, n times p would be my number of successes. And since my p-value is 0.5, in that first case, I'm looking at 25 successes and 25 failures. And so in, since both of those values are greater than 10, I can also say that the distribution is approximately normal. With the binomial distribution, when the probability is low, it'll be skewed to the right. And when the, and when the probability is high, it'll be skewed to the left. And for the last two, every geometric distribution is going to be skewed to the right. And I think that's it. So you do have a homework assignment, and that is what I will ultimately collect. So take some time to complete that and turn that in next class. And I look forward to seeing you.